Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome Marina Kaljurand, the Understate Secretary, uh, the Understate, Under Secretary Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Estonia. Unfortunately, the minister could not come due to urgent issues in the country. So we are very happy to have Marina here participating today. And uh, it's my great pleasure to let you know that she will not only give us a keynote speech, but she will also actively participate in the workshop on cybersecurity, workshop five, which is very much appreciated that we get such a great expertise into the uh, equal footed and overall juridic discussion. Marina, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Sandra, thank you so much for a kind introduction. And, and I'm really sorry that our foreign minister couldn't join us today, but, but I'm privileged and honored to deliver speech on uh, behalf of her and I wish that more people could join us. I understand that yesterday you had a great evening. I'm sorry I missed that. Uh, I'm very pleased to address the Erodic 8th annual meeting today here in Sofia. It was fascinating to read how it all started. A couple of friends meeting in a brasserie in Paris, drinking wine and using the paper tablecloths to visualize the concept of European dialogue on internet-related matters. It reminded me of another story. A few youngsters in the late 90s in an apartment in Tallinn developing a file transfer program called Kazaa. These were those guys who later used the same idea of peer-to-peer -peer technology for creating internet phone calls an invention that billions of people today use as Skype. Even if the dimensions are different, and I bet that the block of flats in Thailand was somewhat less elegant than the brasserie in the French capital, there is something similar about big things. Unfaltering commitment, constant innovation, hard work, and above all, passion. This has made Eurodig a forum that has impact a forum with a growing number of participants and blended mix of stakeholders. I'm also very happy that the event is taking place in Sofia, in the beautiful capital of Bulgaria. I know it's maybe not very trendy to start with rumors, but I do not know how much truth there is in the rumor that Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg had a Bulgarian grandfather or that Bulgarian roots were what inspired John Atanasov to design the first electronic digital computing device at the University of Iowa in the late 30s of the last century. But what I know for sure is that our hosts have always been inspiring with their spontaneous creativity and innovation. Thank you very much for all your work in contributing to the program and of course, also for your warm hospitality. I would like to make a few points on what is important to Estonia when it comes to the internet. Human rights, cybersecurity, the internet as an engine for economic growth for Europe and beyond, and internet governance as the connectivity framework. I will start with freedom of expression on the internet. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Much better now, thanks. I will start with freedom of expression on the internet. Uh, perhaps I'm stating obvious in this forum, but safeguarding freedom of expression and opinion on the internet is an inseparable part of fundamental rights, dignity, and the worth of humans. It forms an essential part of the 21st century human rights. Freedom of opinion and expression is as much a fundamental right on its own accord as it is an enabler of other rights, such as economic, social, and cultural rights. 
adopted by consensus, the United Nations Human Rights Council Resolution on Human Rights on the Internet recognizes that freedom of expression, which is valid offline, should also be valid online. It should therefore be simple, yet everybody in this room knows that it's not. <coughs> Governments violate both freedom of expression offline and online, on the European continent as on all the other continents. In the context of technical development and increasing internet penetration, we see that the vibrant and rapidly growing online community is often a leeway for alternative voices and popular political dissent, particularly in authoritarian countries where traditional media outlets continue to fall under strict government control. The Freedom House report, Freedom on the Net 2014, shows that freedom of expression on the internet is deteriorating, and in fact, has been doing so for the third year in a row. In too many countries, citizens face intimidation, threats, arrests, and the fines from the state because of their activities online. Even in Western democracies, there are worrisome legal developments that seek to ground the government broader power to restrict online contact. What could be done? What should be done? What should we do? We share the view that we do not need new documents. We need the implementation of the already existing commitments. There are a number of international instruments that are at our disposal. At the UN level, we have, the, we have to use the UPR process to reiterate the condemnation of restrictions of, on freedom of expression and call the countries in question to fully respect international human rights law. Estonia has done so in a number of UPR cycles already, and we are encouraging other governments to do the same. The Council of Europe has recently launched a couple of interesting initiatives. For example, a platform for the safety of journalists and freedom of expression, which is an alert mechanism where organizations of media actors can post information regarding violations. I would also like to praise the work of the OSCE representative on freedom of media, Dunja Mijatovic, whose engagement in particular important in dialogue with different governments of OSCE member states. Estonia is very strongly engaged in the Freedom Online Coalition, a group of 26 countries who have committed to working together to support internet freedom and protect freedom of expression and fundamental human rights more generally, in close cooperation with all the stakeholders, governments, civil society, and the private sector. The coalition is supporting the digital human rights activists on the ground through funding and through moral support, which is often as vital as financial. Estonia cheered the coalition in 2014, and we are proud of the Tallinn agenda that was adopted last year at the high-level conference in Tallinn. From here, I would like to continue with the limitations to freedom of expression. Indeed, freedom of expression is not absolute. Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights provides that exercising the freedom may sometimes be subject to restrictions. These restrictions have to be exceptional, prescribed by law, be precise and clear. Last but not least, these restrictions should pursue a legitimate aim and allow for effective remedies. One example of where restrictions may be necessary is hate speech. We have witnessed recently a wave of hate speech against women on the internet, which is accompanied by threats including murders and sexual assault. This form of hate speech targets female politicians, journalists, human rights activists, but also ordinary women who dare to express their opinion or campaign for equal rights. I share the view 
that if we do not combat this particular form of discrimination, we will never be able to eliminate violence against women, which is one of the most extreme forms of violation of human, uh, women's rights. And I stress again, also in this context, the restrictions should be imposed based on a strict and predictable legal framework with due judicial oversight and be proportionate to the aim. On the European continent, it is the European Court of Human Rights which has been tasked to find the right balance between freedoms and restrictions. It is therefore in everybody's interest that the court has enough resources, is efficient and of course independent. Member states should implement judgments and contribute to the raising of public awareness of court case law. In straight legal terms, judgments are binding only in regards to the state, in, not only in regards to the state in question. However, they surely have wider policy implications. I would also like to touch upon internet trolling as another fairly new phenomenon. I read a story in the New York Times last Wednesday this week of how the government of one country has developed a complex myriad of trolls who get paid based on a fixed rate per comment or post for spreading state propaganda, sometimes hate speech, and also war propaganda. Of course, we cannot close our eyes in regards to such a practice. At the same time, we cannot respond by closing or restricting open spaces since the same measures may have adverse effects and worsening the conditions of freedom of expression further. I think our answer to this should be more freedom of expression and not less accompanied by raising awareness of the threats. When talking about freedom of expression, one should also focus on the protection of privacy. Privacy and freedom online must continuously be advanced equally and together. There are complementary values and fundamental for the realization of other human rights and the basis of democratic societies. We all are aware that while opening up new possibilities for global citizens, the internet can also strengthen the hands of governments in some areas where many of us would not like to see them intervening. This is not true only with respect to savvy authoritarian states who squash protests and censor dissent, but also with respect to democratic countries where governments have built the capacity to gather massive quantities of information concerning their people. It is not assuring anymore that phone calls, emails, and social networking data are collected because they are relevant to crime investigations or essential in protecting citizens against international terrorism. The former UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, Mark LaRue, among others, has in one of his reports warned that broad interpretation of outdated laws are enabling sophisticated and invasive surveillance measures to flourish around the world and governments should draw new regulations that properly acknowledge their growing power. More pessimistic views have predicted that the world is galloping into a new form of totalitarianism where the power of entire populations is transferred to an unaccountable complex of transnational spy agencies and corporations. The key word in this debate is democratic control. I agree that some surveillances may be needed in certain justified cases, but in a democratic country it can be legitimate only if it is based on informed consent, not on blind trust in the government. The level of public scrutiny of the legal basis of any kind of surveillance has to be adequate. In simple words, it should be citizens or their elected representatives, not spies and secret courts, who ought to decide what is right and what is not. 
Unfortunately, there is some mistrust also between, partner, among, uh, between partners in Europe and beyond. Therefore, international cooperation is more needed than ever in ensuring that surveillance practices by state security, law enforcement agencies and private companies are in line with international human rights obligations and standards. There is a need to monitor, analyze and report about the situation in respect of the right to privacy. We therefore strongly support the creation of a mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur for the right to privacy. A new Special Rapporteur will bear a huge responsibility by creating the first image of a mandate and by being able to make recommendations to states on the implementation and realization of the right to privacy, including reporting on violations. We hope that the right person will be found to match this challenge. At the Council of Europe, Human Rights Commissioner Muzniaks has expressed his interest to look into the democratic control of surveillance. Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe has made some reasonable recommendations what governments should do. We very much support this work. Now some remarks about cybersecurity. Given the important and increasing role that ICTs play in economic growth and social progress, as well as in the shared goal of protecting human rights and freedoms online, security constitutes an integral and necessary element in developing and sustaining modern information societies. Estonia can speak from our own experience about how an ICT-centric lifestyle and social progress can be threatened by motivated and international state and non-state actors. Modern states need to be vigilant, resilient, and prepared against the threat of cyber attacks. There are several reasons why we need to take cybersecurity seriously. First and foremost, ICTs are vulnerable. And our dependence on the, uh, on the societal and governmental functions of these advanced but inherently vulnerable technologies will only deepen at a national level and expand globally. Secondly, the cyber realm constitutes an operational domain. Many states have announced the development of military cyber capabilities. Many more states are de facto engaged in the development of such capabilities. Thirdly, we are facing serious challenges in the fight against cyber crime. Our failure to get cyber crime under effective control directly inhibits trust in, and therefore the development of ICTs and the information society. We are seeing an alarming tendency of deepening links between cybercrime, transnational organized crime, and serious national security threats. The broad use of digital services demands a high level of digital security. McKinsey and the World, Forum and the World Economic Forum published a joint paper last year estimating that the material effect of slowing the pace of technology and innovation due to a lack of cyber resiliency, could be as high as $3 trillion annually by 2020. Cybercrime is also on the rise and already extracts between 15 to 20 percent of the value created by the Internet. Data breaches have been causing substantial monetary loss for years. The number of lost or stolen data records increased by almost 80% in 2014 compared to 2013. These are worrying numbers and threats undermining the potential and value of digitalization. Besides the fact that many countries are developing and deploying offensive cyber capabilities through their security agencies, or through proxy organizations, there has been a fundamental shift to what is called advanced persistent threats. Stealthy cyber attacks directed at business and political targets over a prolonged time. 
Such attacks objectives typically extend beyond immediate financial gain. We are fundamentally concerned of ABDs. Furthermore, criminal syndicates and hacktivists are using the territory and infrastructure of state to launch attacks for political purposes or illegal gain. Again, these are worrying trends that will affect regional and strategic stability and international relations. In this rather gloomy state of affairs, what can states and non-state actors do to preserve openness and improve security online? A comprehensive and systematic approach to cybersecurity has to start at a national level. It's not an easy task. The complexity of cybersecurity interdependencies is a growing challenge for all states to comprehend and manage. First of all, states must be willing to make dramatic changes to their perceptions and practices of internet security and governance if they are to prevent cyber attacks. Governments need to assure, uh, sorry, governments need to assume the role of both the protectors and the exploiters of technology. They are to protect their economic environment, critical infrastructure, as well as private and public users. As in many other cases involving cyberspace, public-private partnership is crucial for strengthening cybersecurity, starting from a basic cyber hygiene regime and extending to national infrastructure support of energy, financial, and healthcare systems. Like with other internet-related issues, the key is to invest in public awareness, training, and education, the latter covering a broad base of e-skills. This would empower citizens to grasp how their information, communication, and transactions are handled online. This would also help citizens and companies to understand what damage cyber attacks can cause and thus encourage taking action. The good news is that there seems to be a general understanding that when it comes to ICTs and cyberspace, we are dealing with an ecosystem in which everything is interconnected. It functions as a whole and it must be defended as a whole. However, the biggest disagreement both nationally and internationally is not what the outcome ought to be, but how to get there. Building international and interdisciplinary cooperation is essential to have and maintain a free, open, and safe cyberspace. We already have several good forums for discussions and to develop our security measures. The EU has issued its first comprehensive policy document in this area. The OSCE has come up with measures to increase transparency, cooperation and trust at the regional level. The continued expansion of the Council of Europe Convention of Cybercrime demonstrates the growing realization of governments that by developing and utilizing a consistent and proven legal framework, we can tackle cybercrime head and eventually eliminate criminal safe havens. Large-scale cyber exercises hosted by the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center in Tallinn are an excellent example of how countries prepare together to overcome cyber threats. Estonia is also a member of the United Nations Group of Governmental Experts that is currently working to find common normative ground on responsible state behavior in cyberspace. What are we learning from international cooperation is that we need to be more inclusive if we want to succeed. We need to listen to other regions. We need to approach developing countries, not only like-minded allies or the major cyber powers. We need to hear not only what the IT sector thinks, but what concerns many other sectors. And we need to reach out to academia to broaden our horizons. We, the governments, 
also have to start asking policy relevant questions from our academia, civil society, and the private sector. We all have agreed that international law applies to cyberspace. Now we have to agree how. We think that we do, we do not new, need new international treaties, but rather a consensus on how existing international law applies to cyberspace. This can and should be a gradual process where we examine the existing norms, both international law and politically binding norms, to find common ground on some basic questions that concern us all. This is an area where scholars and experts can make a substantive contribution to the dialogue going on at the government level. In the absence of commonly agreed upon standards of responsible state behavior, it is a task, not an opportunity as well as a duty for policymakers, academics and other experts to contribute to the ongoing discussion about norms and what is normal. We consider it essential that countries obey the norms and spirit of international law and do not take advantage of the still bending international consensus of norms of responsible state behavior or the existing legal lacuna. Yes, we agree that cyberspace has unique, has unique characteristics compared to other domains and kinetic activities. But such characteristics should not be viewed as impediments to the application of international law. Instead, they suggest the need for more detailed analysis of the preconditions for and implications of the implementation of relevant norms. We call on states to define and implement responsible behavior. This is required not only to maintain international peace and security, but also to secure the social and economic benefits that ICTs bring. For Estonia, the social, economic, and political military aspects of cybersecurity are tightly intertwined and equally important. I would also argue that the socialization of cybersecurity is the next big thing. It often seems that we're repeating the same slogans, but without necessarily understanding each other. We need policymakers, technologists, lawyers, activists, academics to start speaking the same language. What's more, we need for the average citizen in our countries to talk the talk as well. This is the language that starts with basic, individual cyber hygiene, and ends with universally respected rules of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. This is the language of progress and stability in the cyber age, walking the walk. Security is never absolute. At the end of the day, it's about tolerating and managing real risks. We should not forget what cybersecurity is for. The world has experienced incredible economic and social growth as a result of the development and use of ICTs. The internet and interconnectivity have become powerful tools for social progress and economic benefits. I heard that yesterday you had a very interesting opening panel on how to shape the European digital market. Keen adopter of the benefits of information society we are firm, supporter, we are firm supporters of this process. We also realize how much potential is still unused. In this context, we welcome the release of the European Commission's Digital Single Market Strategy, an ambitious plan on how to advance European digital single market that crosses the borders, but also ensures cybersecurity, the protection of personal data, and helps disruptive digital enterprises to fit into the regulatory model we have developed over 60 years. We all have to work together to make this plan a reality. Again, it will not be easy, but I'm confident that Europe will continue to follow an open, liberal model that is based on the rule of law. 
I am also sure that we will be able to develop the regulation which is necessary to protect the interests of different stakeholders. The debate about the European digital single market is closely connected with another major theme very important for Estonia, the preservation of the multi-stakeholder internet governance model. Internet governance should be seen as the platform from any issues that I have already touched upon today, freedom of expression, right to privacy, cybersecurity, and economic growth. There have been many discussions, what does the multi-stakeholder model mean? In different fora, also during the last days here in Sofia. In Estonian language, by the way, we need six words to describe what we mean, and even then, I'm not sure whether all understand what we're talking about. But I think the essence of it is actually not so complicated. This has been very well captured by the German Foreign Minister Frank-Walter Steinmeier in his opening speech of the last year's Eurodig in Berlin. He said, I quote, it takes many to run the internet and it takes many to make sure it remains free, safe and open. We believe that Europe should be one of the main actors defending open, free and bottom-up internet in the major global internet governance process this year be it VCs plus 10, with the extension of the mandate of IGF, ENA, transition or ICANN accountability. Furthermore, we should not forget that 2015 is European Year of Development and the year when the Sustainable Development Goals will be agreed. We have to provide development assistance to less developed countries in order to connect the unconnected billion and address different issues from cybersecurity threats to employing information and communication technologies for growth, public health and education. International organizations and the states should review their development cooperation and technical assistance programs and direct them more towards information society related capacity building projects. Our experience is that this will be money well spent. We also need a better coordination of efforts between donors and bringing the development cooperation and cyber, the cyber community, the public and private sector. Estonia has initiated cooperation with countries who would like to build a well-functioning e-governance system. We have been approached by many developing countries who have made setting up an e-government their national objective. The first cooperation projects have already been implemented in Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, and with the Palestinian National Authority. And work is continuing with the governments of many other countries, including the region of Southeast Europe. Our proactive approach means that we have also opened up our e-government applications to the world through our e-residency program and making many central solutions open source. We want the entire world to benefit fully from the digital revolution and we are ready to work with any and all countries who share our goal and dream of a free, open and secure internet for all. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to end my speech by thanking everybody for being part of the Eurodig. It is the participation of each one of you that makes this conference so special and a great venue to speak. I will later be discussing some, in some more details in the panel on cybersecurity and hope to see at least some of you there. And I would like to wish us all a good, continuous continuation of the conference. Thank you.